The rune is just the letter L. Really, every version of the runic alphabet, and there's several, this is the letter uh, L. And so what I see is L, like you would put, you know, maybe loser on your head, but I doubt that's what it's intended to stand for. Hi, I'm Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse specialist, previously teaching Old Norse language and myth at uh, many universities in the US, and now working as a public educator on YouTube and through my books. And today, I'm reacting to the latest trailer for God of War Ragnarok. It looks like he's cutting something that's binding tear. That's interesting because it's kind of a reversal of the myth that we read about in Snorri Sturluson's prose at a, where Tyr is the god who puts his hand in the mouth of the giant wolf, Fenrir, in order to pacify the wolf enough that he can be tied up with rope that can't be broken by anything else. So it's not Tyr himself who's tied up. And of course, it's hard for me to even recognize this figure here as Tyr, given that the one canonical thing we really know about him is that Tyr is missing his right hand. He put it in the mouth of the wolf as a pledge that the wolf wouldn't be tied up forever. And of course, what were they doing but tying the wolf up forever? So maybe there's a different timeline here in the game. Maybe, you know, they've elaborated on the story and made Tyr the original prisoner. Maybe the wolf is bound later. Maybe the wolf has escaped at this point and bound Tyr up in the thing that bound him up. But I don't know where Tyr's hand is in that case. Hard to say what's going on here. These god of and goddess of labels really don't work well in Norse mythology, where the gods aren't particularly assigned domains or spheres. There are more personalities than they are roles. Actually, if I were to call any god god of war, I'd probably call it Odin because he's the god who uh, encourages war. He's the one who stirs up battles so that he can get men killed and harvest their souls. How exactly Tyr got labeled as god of war, I don't know. I think people call him that because Tuesday is equivalent to Mars Day, but there's no real reason to call him god of war or god of anything else in particular. If it is open, I would expect him to be one-eyed. All of the gods are injured in some particular way, often missing a, a limb. I, of course, can't see whether he's missing an eye here, but the scene does remind me of Odin as the Wanderer. We see that multiple times in Albemarle, where he's coming to the door of a host and, and seeking hospitality. We also see it in something like Saga of Fairborn Hadric. The Wanderer with the shattered face showing up to the door definitely evokes Odin, even if I can't confirm it with the, the one eye thing. You know, actually, I, I like the way that this game takes its own direction with some of the gods' appearances, like the the, the potbelly weightlifter Thor, for example. I, I think a bald Odin is enough that doesn't challenge the canon in, in any way. He certainly canonically has a great beard, but I can't remember a point where his hair per se is mentioned. It might be, but I, I can't remember that. Mistletoe is very important in the myth of the death of Baldur. So if we backtrack a minute, in the in the Prozetta, Baldur is the most beautiful of the gods, and all of the gods want to make sure that he will never die. So his mother, Prig, who might well be the same goddess as Freya, and, and the game certainly takes that perspective, goes around everything in all the worlds and makes everything swear not to harm Baldur. But the one thing she doesn't get that oath from is mistletoe, because she says mistletoe is too young to swear an oath. This is a big motif in Norse literature that something will be, something or someone will be too young to swear an oath, and then that will be the one called on to break the oath for everyone else. So Loki goes and gets a uh, sprig of mistletoe. It's it's weird, actually, because the way Snorri describes it is like it's a tree, and uh, he has a weapon, uh, Snorri calls it a wonder, that's our word, wand, uh, made out of it, and has the blind god Hother throw it at Baldur and that's what kills him. What she's seeing then is probably something that evokes some regret for her if the timeline of the games is something like that of the Eddas because it's something that she failed to secure the oath from and that if she had, maybe her son Baldur would still be alive. So of course the game is going to adapt it in a way that maybe is more dramatic uh, in a 21st century sense. But the original story is very weird and one of its very weird elements is that it is mistletoe, this weird little parasitic plant that is the, uh, the murder weapon. The rune is just the letter L. Really, every version of the runic alphabet, and there's several, this is the letter uh, L. You know, people attribute a lot of magical powers to these individual letters today, but in the ancient and medieval periods, these were really just an alphabet for writing. And so what I see is L, like you would put, you know, maybe loser on your head, but I doubt that's what it's intended to stand for. Oh. 
so immediately what's evoked for me is in the prophecy of Ragnarok, Bolspa and Bafu the Small, which I translated in the Kodaketa. I've got a little poster right here. There's these two wolves, Hati and Skull, and each one will swallow one of the heavenly bodies, the sun or the moon. Hati swallows the moon and Skull swallows the sun, although Vasu is the small. But immediately what's evoked here for me is those two wolves who will swallow the sun and moon. Of course, it's interesting that they're not literally swallowing the heavenly bodies here, but apparently watching that happen. Interesting interpretation of what's going on with the, the wolves swallowing these things. I, I, I wonder what part the wolves will play in the game because I would have expected them to take a more literal, physical biting role in the in the midst. Obviously, they're part of recent Scandinavian folklore, if you think of Hans Christian Andersen, but they really don't come up anywhere that I can think of in ancient or medieval sources. I mean, probably the closest thing is in one of the sagas of Iceland's early bishops. One of the early bishops has to fight a woman who is part seal, but that's, I doubt that's what they're trying to draw on here. She doesn't look too much like a seal to me. I mean, it's impossible not to adapt, right? Especially when you're trying to tell a story that feels complete to a modern audience. Because our sources are so fragmentary and so conflicting, it's very difficult to adapt them straight out of the page. Not to be too grandiose about it, something like God of War is approaching the sources reasonably respectfully and, and trying to do some of the adaptation work that's been going on for at least 800 years. The core of these stories is so appealing, so human, so dramatic, that we want to retell them for our own times. And the people behind God of War are just the next people in the 2020s adapting it to their own time. And I think that's perfectly appropriate and, and, and fine. But I do like to make clear what comes from our medieval sources and what is the work of modern adapters. For more God of War Ragnarok, why not watch our video with Jackson Crawford explaining Fenrir?